Not that I wouldn't want you to come and see it. But uh, I haven't loaded up the slides yet, but I will. So you'll have those as well. But if you're interested in the application piece as opposed to just the conceptual, which I'll also talk about, you'll get more front. Did lunch just break out? Okay. I'll give it a little bit of time. So if you're seated next to someone, or you're sort of spread out that you haven't spoken with, or meeting, who's new to you, um, if you could introduce each other, that would be great. So we have, I'm like online, right? Like, oh my gosh, people. So if you could just introduce yourself. Come on in. We've been waiting for you. Yeah. And I, I am inviting you to come a little bit forward if you are interested in seeing the details. It's going to be a lot easier to see things. You might have to zoom in. Um, you'll see a. I might actually launch a class so you can. All right, we're going to get started a little bit. Um, actually, I should probably introduce myself. <laughs> Most of you don't know who I am. Okay. Yeah. So I'm me, Beth, with Steal Your Booth. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm a program coordinator, which probably would be like a chair for the institutions, and uh, I'm an associate professor. I lead our uh, implementation of our new baccalaureate program at Pierce College um, Washington, in Washington State. You um, know where Pierce College might be? Okay. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. yeah. And uh, historically, a two year institution, but we're rolling out four year baccalaureates. Uh, well, I guess baccalaureates are four years. And um, I think we're having our sixth one coming up in about two quarters. And the one that um, I'm responsible for rolling out is the Baccalaureate of Applied Science and Applied Business Management. Yes, applied is said twice there. <laughs> Go figure. We really want to emphasize it's experiential. Right. So uh, thank you. I, I teach online. I teach hybrid. I teach face-to-face. -face, I, I teach morning, day, and night. Uh, I've been at the institution for four and a half years now and loving it. You may have heard that Pierce College was um, recognized by the Aspen Institute as one of the top five native colleges in the nation. So we really have a lot to live up to. So if I screw up here, please don't tell my superiors uh, to live up to this. So, but what I would like to do is get to know you a little bit. And so I prepared um, uh, a quick poll. So if you could uh, go to your device, if you're willing, um, otwise, you could just play long and kind of keep it in your mind. But it would be the easiest probably is to go to wholeev.com, just launch a browser. Sorry, it's at the top there, but it's MBB742 is my arena. Or you can do the text thing, uh, the number 37607, and you, you just text MBB742 as your password. Okay? And I just want to get a sense, uh, this is a survey, there won't be no right or wrong answers, it just gives me a sense of where um, our learning community is.
Oh, no, there's more. I'm just going to wait. <laughs> so when you're ready, just look up so I can go to the next one. Okay, I'm going to just count down five, four, three, two, one. Okay, here's the next one. Hopefully, next one. So that was 50-50. Okay. A predictor of course completion is... Again, just a survey. Come join us. <laughs> oh, you must be an A student. I have high <laughs> expectations of you. <laughs> okay. Five, four, three, two, one. For our learning community, if you can just note sort of mentally where we are on this. Okay. Our answers is mental. So student motivation there was the top. Um, longer courses attract more enrollments. Is this true or false? Should really do a count, shouldn't it? Doesn't do that. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, Ninety percent. Okay. Longer courses have lower completion rates. True or false? For those of you joining us, you have two means to join us. Either launching a browser on your device, uh, pollev.com forward slash MBB742, or go by the text method. Okay? So generally true here in this crowd. Five, four, three, Two, one. Okay. Does your institution require passing an LMS orientation like Canvas or Blackboard or Moodle before registering online? Five, four, three. Two, one. Okay. How many 100% online courses have you taken? 100% fully yourself taken, not just taught. Okay. Too many to count. <laughs> Five, four, three, two. What's your definition for courses on that? Online courses? I mean, it could, someone could have to do, you know, safe schools and you know, professional development. Oh, any. Okay. Just one that's 100% online. It could have been a week. It could have been 10 weeks. Just a fully online course that you took in any type. Okay? Not a hybrid course, but 100%. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. This is a Likert scale. Your rating. I am very proficient with adult learning principles. Five, four, three, two, one. I am proficient with tilt. And if I have to tell you what that is, the answer should be. Two, one. Okay. I'm very proficient with UDL. Four, 
five, four, three, two, one. All right. So, oh, it's changing still. So, okay. All right. So, your type of educational institution, public, private, private, not for profit, other. We're all dependent on tax dollars. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and move on. That one is. All right. What is your school role? Faculty, administrator, instructional designer, technologist, and other very important professional. Okay, go ahead and move to the next. Okay, this is, oh, I already answered that. We already did that, very good. Okay, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. That gives me a sense of who is here and where you might be. I do have a couple more questions. Um, how many of you were here last year for the same session that I had? This one person, okay. I did change it a little bit because I knew you were coming. I knew it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, anyone in here interested in single course change versus program? You know, like increasing your online completion rate for your class versus for your entire program. So, your class, just your class. Okay. Your program. Okay. Oh, that's a mix. All right. I'm going to have to run through some. How many of you are currently have capacity to make whole change of at least one course for the year? So it's fall now. You have capacity to do this, to change your course in one year. Okay, good. All right. Um, many of you have, might want to see an explanation for, how did I place it? how systemic structure limits our ability to eliminate opportunity gaps online or otherwise. Yeah. So it would be a diagram because it's very complicated. So right, we talk about systemic barriers, right? We hear that a lot, like what's a system? What is a systemic barrier? How many would be interested in seeing what that looks like graphically? Okay, well that's a lot. That's my entire slideshow. No, just kidding. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip some things because of what I saw and you saw because we just I want to just be able to attend to things that I feel like the, the learning community in general will be able to appreciate now given who we are in this space. But the entire slide deck will be available. And so my name and how you can reach me, I will also be available to you. Okay? So let me just go ahead and get started. We already did that. So today, the purpose is really to talk about a coherent course structure, right? So we can increase online completion rates at the course level and the program level so, and to improve student learning. So we're not just improve, we're just not increasing online completion rate, but we're also increasing learning at the same time, okay? That's our goal. And um, we're going to have some skills and knowledge by the end of this session. Uh, you'll be able to describe factors that impact student learning, although I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one. Um, we're going to apply practical research-based uh, strategies or principles. I will not be able to go deeply on each of those, but I will touch base on some of them. I'm going to trust that you will, you will know how to look for information. But what I want to do is demonstrate what it looks like in a class. All right. So, for example, I'm not going to be able to go over all of UDL, right? That's that, that's going to be like months. So, but I'm going to show you what it could look like, so you can see that, right? And then we're going to an analyze course design aspects that impact online completion rates, and I'm going to do that most more or less um, at the structure picture. Okay. All right. So. Some context, I'm going to do very quickly. Why do we do this? We have population shifts, right? We have uh, dem demographics shifting. We have diverse uh, students, more non-traditional students. And then we have 
lower birth rates, which means we now have less enrollments, which means that practically, from a moral standpoint, we just want to increase our en enrollment rates, right? Uh, uh, our uh, uh, completion rates. Excuse me, I've had two hours of sleep, so I'm going to trip over my tongue. Um, but from a practical level, we want to keep as many of our students in our building, in our classrooms, from a practical level. But the moral imperative certainly is higher. Because we have skill shifts due to globalization and di digitization, we also want to pay more attention to the cognitive aspects of learning online. Some of the behavioral aspects are a little bit hidden. So we want to think more about the cognitive aspects. We'll discuss a little bit. And then, of course, we have funding shifts, which um, you know, m increasingly more accountability-based. So we have, even at the faculty level, I mean, certainly we'd want our students to uh, you know, uh, complete their courses. But for administrators, we really are concerned a lot about, are we going to be able to get our funding? This has already visited K-12. It is knocking on higher ed's door now, right? All right, so increasing online enrollments, even though enrollments in general have decreased, but the lower completion rates than face-to-face. -face. Uh, longer online courses have higher enrollments. Longer online courses, however, have lower completion rates, okay? But, and it suggests, though, that students actually want substance in our classes but they're not completing at the same rates. That's what the, you know, if they didn't want longer classes, then you know, they probably did not want as much to learn in their right. So, and then we are seeing in, the, in several studies that you know, 10 to 15 percentage points higher, um, uh, they would draw higher than face-to-face, -face, and that in California, um, those online completion rates, this is 2015, uh, they're lower there, and they're even lower for subpopulations. They are increasingly non-traditional students, part-time students of color, and students with disabilities. And these are the same students that are, they are seeking online options now, because life is busy, right? And they want access to higher education and the like. And so in Washington State, this is a 2011 study, but it's still relevant. Uh, we also found that we're more likely to withdraw from online courses. Uh, they were, if they took their online courses earlier in the terms, they were also less likely to return. And that if a higher proportion of their credits were online, they were less likely to complete. It's a huge problem, in other words. Um, students have a variety of motivations for taking online courses, but motivation is not one of the reasons why they don't complete. Does that shock anyone? A little bit? Okay. But they do complain about technical difficulties, a sense of isolation, a relative lack of structure, and a general lack of support. They feel like they just got thrown in this room, and like, ah, what do we do here? And that the vast majority of our online courses mirror face-to-face -face courses. So we basically take our face-to-face -face courses and we plop them in, in a digital fashion, onto our online spaces. So for those of you who may have taken online courses, you may have seen a little bit of this, how it manifests itself that way, okay? So in their current design, they're just really difficult to do, I mean, to just to succeed. And they're particularly difficult for students who are least prepared. And least prepared is defined as those who are performing at um, lower, you know, less than a college level. That's how we, uh, the studies uh, define less prepared students. And so, but I want to talk about opportunity gaps, because we hear that. We hear that a lot, like, what does that mean? What are opportunity gaps? Well, the opportunity gaps are really conditions. And they result, right? So opportunity gaps result from disabling conditions that keep segments of our student populations from performing at high levels. Disabling conditions, okay? Because we make assumptions about what they can and cannot do there. And there, a lot of its mental models is very, uh, you know, it's very hidden to us, okay? And those opportunity gaps lead to achievement gaps. That's sort of the logical conclusion there. And so when people say uh, equity gaps, we're not talking about equality, we're talking about conditions of fairness and whether or not those student, our students are set up to perform at high levels or is it favoring other students and others. And so in our online course design, we have to account for that. We have to account for the disabling conditions, okay? 
And so here's the subsystem structure, as you voted to see it. So now you get to, to see it. So in the course design delivery structure, and this can, and we call it subsystem because you know the system's huge, and systems within systems and, and so on. So you can look at this from the course level, and you can also look at this at pro programmatic level. So if you were looking at it from a uh, an administrator, you could just sort of look at it from the balcony stage. If you were looking at it from an instructor, you look at it from your own perspective, like how you would see this, all right? And so at the middle here, you see the achievement gaps. And those are really, uh, those are symptoms of the real problem, which are opportunity gaps. Okay. The opportunity gap symptom are the achievement gaps. And so what happens is this, that when we see achievement gaps, we shift the burden. This is, we shift the burden of fixing the problem to easy fixes. So we do one-off things that we do, like we embed pretty things into our courses. Uh, we might do a video here and there, do an app and so on. We might you know, do one thing at a time to try to solve this problem, but they're not systemic. And so the achievement gap does not change. I mean, the performance can go up a little bit, but the gap remains, meaning that there are students that are increasing, but the, even though the, the you know, other subpopulations may be increasing, that gap does not move very much. Have you seen this? Probably seen this in your stats, right? And so we, we have well-intended easy uh, fixes to solve the symptoms, and then we just go back kind of circularly. The problem with that, though, is that um, we have structural behaviors. So this is what we're talking about, structural behaviors. So we avoid doing the coherence the thing that we have to do completely, the wholesale change of course, and it maintains the status quo. It is not because we don't want to make a change. It's just that it's so hard and it takes so much time. And so we begin to rely on the fixes. It becomes a systemic behavior, right? And so we have a habit of you know, picking the next shiny object and then we put it in our course, in our attempt to fix this problem. The short-term benefits, but they don't fix the achievement gaps. We don't increase the online completion rates, particularly for, uh, significantly for um, um, diverse students. And it diverts us from our attention to really solving the problem because our time is spent doing that. We just go going round and round and round. And then some faculty trying this over and over again may just say, golly, I can't really do much. And you might feel exhausted and say, well, this is just the way it goes. And so our goals basically, we stop trying very hard. But there are side effects, right? So there are lower retention rates which affect future enrollments. Because if we're not keeping them, it affects the future, right? And then um, we heavily re rely and shift, continue to shift the burden on our professional development. We gotta fix this problem. We have accountability-based funding now. We gotta go put more on our professional development. But those are one-off usually. They're not sustained over the year. This is why I ask, do you have the time to do it for one year? And then of course you have faculty fatigue. Of course those have costs, time, money, and use of talent. And this side effects are looking for a solution, which is at the other end. There are actually faculty, you're probably among them, who are really trying very hard to do fundamental changes, coherent based you know, tilt, UDL, and so on. But that takes so much time, so there's a delay in the system to realizing the full effect. But you, you, you persevere, keep trying, try. There's another delay, right? And because we're busy, we have, we have teaching, we have uh, instructional duties, we have advising, and we have shared governance, and maybe we're teaching a moonlight too. So it's really hard to sustain this because there, there's huge delays. So what happens is that we do this sort of figure eight, we go back up to the, this, right? And we might try this, but we really spend more time up here. We're doing with easy fixes. That's the structural reality that we're in. But our goal is to spend more time here and to reduce that delay so that we can realize the changes that will affect increased enrollment rates across the board, not just for one class, but several of your classes, okay? And to do that, we're going to have to have leverage points and, you're go and we're going to need other people to help us. We're going to need instructional designers. Who are instructional designers here? Uh, that's job safety right there. 
Yeah. Technologist, anyone technologist? Yeah, yeah. And sustained professional development, like for faculty, uh, for Pierce College, we have the salary increment plan, like we're supposed to develop our professional development, and we get salary increment for that. If we can devise a way so that we're paid to, you know, to sustain that time year long, then we can start to scale. But we're going to need instructional designers and technologists to do it so that we are not replicating many times across the institution, there's scale. And that's what we need is scale and time to redesign, okay? So, but there has to be a framework because we're not just gonna release everybody to do their thing, right? So, um, part of my doctoral work is to look at equitable education frameworks in the digital age and to really look at sustainable models so that this can happen because the work is urgent. And there's so many efforts, but what's our unifying framework to get it done in a scalable way? And so first, this is sort of the picture, right? There are ideas of rigor. Oh, good, I can press the button, nothing moves. All right, so uh, obviously you want rigor. We'll talk about that. Address student readiness, evidence-based practices, institutional support, and of course we want continuous quality improvement. It's just online learning here, but it's really student success. But, you know, we'll talk about online learning here because that's how it'll look here. So first, what rigor means, I want to be very clear, what rigor means here is the alignment of content, outcomes, and assessment, inclusive of instructional support that's appropriate for the complexity of the task. That's rigor. It's not really rigorous if we're asking students to do you know, this le level of work without that being aligned with the rest of it, right? So I just want to make sure that we're clear about what that means because we're not talking about lowering the bar. We're talking about keeping high expectations with high support so that our students can perform at high levels across the board, okay? Student readiness here talks about, um, well, you know what? We have varied readiness in our classrooms. Just, just varied readiness, so we have to be prepared. There are disabling conditions when we toss students, we toss, invite them to come into our space. I guess we don't toss them. You invite them in our space and we expect them to perform in our LMS, our learning management systems, without having even seen that space before, right? So um, it would be important to have some kind of readiness assessment, if you could do that. If it could require an LMS orientation, that levels the playing field a little bit, right? I get the most comments on the publish all the modules in week zero, we'll talk about that. Why week zero? Onboarding steps on week one, if you don't have these on board set up so that you can dive in week two with all content. And we require a backup plan because there's technological issues and we wanna work with our technologists to make sure that we can actually support students who have technological issues, right? And we routinize the delivery. I talked about repetition earlier in our lunch but routinizing the delivery helps us instill habits of success, okay? So evidence of ev uh, equity-based practices like intentional design mindset, adult learning principles, show it a little bit here, tilt, transparency in learning and teaching, uh, uni universal design for learning, and culturally responsive high impact practices. I won't be able to go through each and every single one of those, but uh, you can research a lot of this, but I'll show you how this can look also online, okay? And the idea there is we make the implicit explicit. We do not assume that students know how to navigate the complexities of online and the learning of an asynchronous uh, environment where cognitive, we, we have cognitive complexities happening at many dimensions, many, many, many dimensions, okay? And there's social issues as well. Um, of course, we will need instructional support to get this uh, to work. And then some of you may have, well, I don't have an ID. Well, there are other ways, right? We need technologists, we need our institutional research because we need data to be able to respond where things are working or not working. And we need to pivot. If something isn't working in our classroom, we need to know why. And then we need to pivot, right? We don't wanna be stuck. And then um, extended professional learning, not just one off. So things hold together, they become coherent, okay? And then we need time. 
time to apply the principles. And it would be great, it's my dream, really, that for every single month, at least we have a one or two hour focus in our institution, just for the faculty to roll up their sleeves and work together. Wouldn't that be nice? K-12 does it now, this professional learning communities, their early release, late dismissals, it's great. My husband's, by the way, a K-12 teacher, he tells me all this, I'm like, stop it. Anyway, I wish I had that, right? So continuous quality improvement, just like it sounds, um, and we use artifacts to make the student learning visible to us. We don't guess, right? Uh, like, my gut doesn't have a database, so I have to kind of take a look at what the data actually says. It needs to be evidence-based, and then it needs to be current. I have to be able to immediately apply what I have learned so that the next cycle of classes reflect my learning about my class, how the student's learning has now become visible to me. I make changes now. Okay, you'll hear me hear me say a lot of I terms um, because I've, I've learned that you know I, I can only speak from this perspective. But I'd like you to invite yourself and see yourself in that space as well. Okay, all right. So the end goal is to obviously to increase online completion rates by eliminating opportunity gaps. And so let's talk about andragogy, adult learning principles, and um, what they are. Right. So. This is a classroom, but imagine this in online. You are not visible. You, neither are your students, but they are there, and so are you. Adults have a need to know. Why am I, why are, why are we learning this? Um, what are we supposed to learn here? And by the way, how are we supposed to complete this assignment? Have you ever found yourself in that position in online learning yourself. Adults have agency, so they ask. Their time is valuable, so they go, they, I, I want to know what's going on here. I have some choices to make. My light's busy, you know? What, am I, what, what are we supposed to do here? I paid for this, right? And so they're also self-directed. And they say, I'd like to, you know, discover some of this myself, and I'd like your help if I need it. Please be available. And they have prior experience. They, we have prior experience. We're adult learners, right? And we have mental models. And it's really kind of important to understand what those might be so that we can, if, if our goal as learners or as teachers is to change a mental model, it'd be kind of important to know what the mental models are that our students are actually operating from or to use the mental models that they're, use, they're using so that we can leverage them from their own experiences. Right? And that the readiness to learn is life related. This should sound really familiar to us in this room because we're adults and it's developmental, task oriented. Right? So, how does, and they want to know how does this fit? How does this relate to something that matters? I don't want this so, so theoretical that I can't apply. Okay? And so that leads to being problem centered and contextual. Now, learners. Adult learners are also intrinsically motivated. That doesn't mean that they're not going to respond to extrinsic motivation, but this idea of self-growth and, and um, you know, lifelong learning and a sense of development is really a strong force to be reckoned with. So trying to leverage that. And so hidden in our, our classrooms are often is like we haven't necessarily tapped that very, very powerful force. Like what's in it for you? Very, very powerful. Lots of research, this is the done science on here. And so uh, it's best though to use the principles in context, adapted to fit the actual students in your classroom. And that's why I asked you these questions earlier so that I can go and kind of figure out what we may have here, okay? And so this is, um, Knowles is, you know, like the father of adult learning principles, and let me just run through this one here. But he says that in order to apply this, you should understand context, okay? Who are your adults? So we're talking about non-traditional students, we're talking about part-time students, we're talking about students with disabilities, we're talking about all kinds of students. And understanding who is in our classroom, really, really super important, so that our delivery is relevant, right? And so there are ways to do that. You will get this tool in, when I load it up um, soon. So this is, uh, again, from Knowles. 
So you basically, you don't have to fill each one of these, but you do, we, we would do an analysis of how, of who our students are, given the subject matter and how they might, you know, what, what these particular influences might be on the subject matter given, so this matrix, like they need to know and subject matter and so on. So let me just go in a little bit, give you an example, okay? So in this case, and I just did, you know, the, the quartile there, I believe, is that in my class, for example, and Biz 101, I have a secret shopper project where they actually have to go outside and visit a store and be the secret, you know, and, and score um, the business against standards and all that, which is, like, why are we doing this in Biz 101? It's a survey course, so why am I going outside? Well, I want to explain how that project explores business functions, operations, and marketing. So I actually have a video about that. Okay, and then the individual learner uh, at that uh, at that um, space, varying skills and time availability to complete project in quality manner. So I break it down in stages to three, because it's a large project, and so I want to make sure that they're able to do the work in a quality manner. So I break it down in three projects. All right. So self concept of the adult is heavily dependent upon a move toward self direction. There are several parts to project along a timeline. So provide tutorials and diagrams and allow for choice to business uh, observation. I don't say, you know, here are the businesses. You can cho choose your business as long as it's a small, uh, small business, not like Gap or something, right? So anyway, you would do this analysis so you get a sense of who is in your classroom and the kinds of supports that we would have to develop, okay? And it takes time to do that. It takes time to do that, All right? Like here, situational working adults. Well, in this particular class, I open assignments early and I widen the exam time window because I have working adults. And so I used to have an exam on Friday online, two hour window, this is your time, you take it. Can you just imagine how many emails I got about, I can't do it then, right? Now it's Wednesday, 8 a.m., Friday, 11.59. I don't get, I get one son of time, you know, I'm going to be out of town. Okay, no problem, okay? So that recognizes that an adult situationally needs that, okay? So, so there are applications to that. Um, there are different applications. So just truncated need to know. The concept is transparency. Here are some strategies, and I'll give you some examples. We'll start to see this more in, real, in reality. Right? Autonomous self-concept, what's the main con choice and flexibility? Here are things that you can do strategically or tactically, right? Tap life experience, really it's about application, well, experiential projects, discussion boards, so if people can talk about their stories and apply and, you know, uh, and, and craft the discussions in a way that uh, harnesses that. Uh, and developmental readiness, social connection, task orientation. UDL is great for that, discussion boards. And you can see some of these really overlap, right? And their checklists, we'll see that in a little bit. Life and problem-centered orientation. They want immediate value, experiential feed work, interactive, adaptive technologies, and so on. This is where I have that, you know, project, project. The secret shopper, for example. It's very, exper students love that, ex that secret shopper. It's amazing. The, the kinds of uh, student evaluations I get on that, it's amazing. They're like, I've never had to do something outside of the classroom. This is amazing. I'm like, good. Right? So intrinsically motivated, this is about meaning, right? Actualization and relevance. And so tilting the course, the assignments, the syllabus, and really providing the kind of feedback that's collegial, less instructional, more collegial. A different position, really. Shared power with students when it's more collegial. It's powerful. It makes them feel like they have control as well and choice. Okay, so tilt. Transparency in teaching and learning. Um, tilt, before I go into it, um, it's its own pedagogy. It is not a template. It is not your headers. Okay, I want to make sure that's very, very clear. And I really, really invite you to read uh, Charles Milner's work on opportunity gaps and see if you could, how you would then apply that in TILT. Because TILT really talks about eliminating opportunity gaps. 
okay, in transparency and clarity. And so the idea is that you're clear and you account for the journey. Why are we here? Okay. What are we learning? What is our end goal? I don't know why I did that. Uh, what are we learning? The skills and knowledge. So you saw earlier, I started out with the skills and knowledge, right? So I should have done that. Tasks. How are we going to learn? What are those things that we're going to do? And how do we know we've learned it? These are like rubrics and your standards. And have that be all up front. When students make that connection and alignment, then they become on board. They have a map. Like, oh, like, think about that for a minute. Like, if I were in Washington State and I want to go to Florida, and I knew that was going to be, you know, a two-week trip, I'm not going to just look at the next 10 miles. I'm going to want the entire map, right? I'm going to know, I want to know what, why I'm going there, where my pit stops are, and so on. So it really reduces my anxiety a lot, okay? And you do the same thing um, at, the, at the course level, at the program level. So why are we learning it? The rationale, why this course in the larger context and why it matters? Like for, you know, whether it's English 101 or Biz 101 or Biology, what, make that clear. Where does this fit in the larger scheme, scheme of things? Where is its relevance? What is its relevance, right? What are we learning? The course outcomes that's aligned. So I, I teach in pro, uh, professional technical. So our, our set of courses are, you know, we don't have, we, it's very tight. And it meets industry standards. And talking about how this meets industry standards really helps students understand, like, that's why we spend time here doing X, Y, and Z. Very, very important. And that how we're going to learn the assignments, again, alignment, the content outcomes assessment, and instructional supports. That alignment then really achieves rigor, okay? And how we have to learn, and how we know we've learned is rubrics that's aligned the course, and I'll show you a rubric. Um, to the course outcomes, okay? So again, we make the implicit explicit. All right, so same thing. You could do this the, on the assignment. So you could do it at the a program level, course level, and assignment level. Just make that very clear. Why are we here? What are we going to learn? How are we going to get there? And how do we know that we've succeeded, okay? Universal design for learning, a lot of brain, neuroscience. And you'll see that a lot of these actually overlap. So tilt. Uh, adult learner principles in this, and because it's about the same brain, really, right? So it's the why of learning, engagement, the what of learning, how we present information, organize it and deliver it, and how of learning, how it is expressed, the kinds of actions we take, okay? And universal design for learning is really an umbrella term for a lot of other um, concepts and principles, okay? So you can see learn, uh, transparency in learning and so on. And I'd invite you to go to CAST, C-A-S-T dot org. You have this great rubric um, that you can just click. It's a great resource. And I'll just draw your attention to some of these here. Like if you were to click that, it would take you to resources, checklists. It's awesome, right? So here, promote self-regulation. Promote expectations and beliefs that optimize motivation. Provide prompts, reminders, guides, and so on. And you just, you know. It'll give you ideas there as well. I love checklists. Comprehension, here's another example. And execution fun function, goal setting. And so a lot of resources are re is great at cast.org. And if you were to go this direction, I would just pick those things that you can implement and just incrementally chip away. You won't be able to do all of it. It's rich, right? But that's the continuous quality improvement aspect of it. High impact practices generally um, are those practices that are outside of the classroom and uh, the, the extent that those can be uh, culturally responsive, the better. And, you know, when we look at our content, really take a look, look at the content and see, and see how wide is my aperture. When, I'm, when I put my content together, how wide is my aperture? Who is not seen? Because what you want to do is widen that aperture. And say, ah, that's a more accurate portrayal of the world. Okay, and there's lots of good uh, material um, resources that you could look up for that as well. So let's look at the sample course and what this looks like. 
Okay? All right. So coherent application, this is adult learning principle, tilt, and aspects of it, and UDL principles. And I do have a live course that we can look at if this doesn't uh, work out the way it goes. But examples, the syllabus, the homepage, modules, routines, assignments, rubrics, engagement. So those are the kind of examples you will see here in a moment. And so the syllabus sets the context, the organization, right, the structure and the logic, and it meets these principles specifically, others as well. And I'm just going to show you the table of contents. So I said what it looks like. Okay. So you probably can't see that. Sorry. So we'll go a little maybe closer. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So my my syllabus is like twenty some pages, and most of it at the back end are administrative things about the college and resources and supports. The stuff the students really want to know is what happens in the classroom. But those things in the back I put because I cannot assume that students understand their rights. Some students don't know that they have already paid for tutoring. It's already there at the writing center and all that. They're like, oh, I've got to pay for that. No, it's yours. Or that, 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 that there are, you know, counseling and that they have rights. So I don't want those hidden, it's particularly for our first generation college students who do not yet understand how to navigate. How many of you are first college? Generation college students. Yeah. I was. Still am, I guess. I guess I mean you're always a first generation college student. Right? So I I I roamed around the University of Washington for seven years until I figured it out. My mom and dad didn't know. I was to did not know what to ask. So um, that has really helped me understand how to make that explicit to students so you don't have to spend your time lost, okay? So a welcome message, course purpose, structure, required materials, skills and other requirements, and so on, learning outcomes, the abilities, teaching philosophy, and so on. I really tried to talk to him as, you know, I'm a real human being who cares, okay? And then I go into the weekly module, talk about that. And so, which you'll see here in a moment. So the homepage, and this is the online homepage, it sets the stage again, and it maps. It maps and aligns with the syllabus. Those two should be talking hand in hand, each other, right? And so here's a, a screenshot of it. And you can see that only those spaces that I want students to go are shown. Home, announcements, modules, grades, people, and e-learning tutoring. If you're, however this works for you here, have all kinds of other spaces like files, discussion board, you know, those are spaces, those are places students just get lost. They just do. They get confused. We have cognitive overload. Like, I'm supposed to be clicking here. What am I looking for? Just get rid of them, right? And then um, it has, and this is mobile uh, friendly. And this is why you need a technologist to help you develop the cascading style sheets because as a faculty, probably you don't have the HTML know-how, but maybe you do, right? But it helps to have this so that, because our students are working on their mobile now, right, devices. And so it's important to do that, make sure those are ready to go. There are four, um, there are, you can approximate that without the cascading style sheets but it's a little tougher. It really is. Okay? And so, I just want to go back and see what this looks like. So, we have welcome, get started, course organization, learning outcomes, and so on. And so, I'm just going through the down the page, getting started, course organization, and weekly learning activities, very upfront. Here's our routine and our weekly learning activities. Okay? Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, routinize. Here's our learning activity. What's the purpose? What's the estimated time to complete? Right up front. So you can plan. You can plan. There's no excuse, by the way, if you've seen it, right? Learning outcomes. In modules, we have a clear roadmap. Again, lines up with everything, right? Clear signposts, expectations, and timeline. And release all of the modules in week zero, all of it. And you probably don't see it, but they're also dated. Because I say week three, and it goes, I don't know, 
What week are we in? Right now. Are we week four right now? I don't know. So but put the dates in for students and you can uncollapse that, right? And put that in. All of it. Why? Again, for the same reason, like if you were going to Washington to Florida, you kind of want to know what's going on. You, you do. And I understand that if you were just building your courses right now, you won't have all the course modules. That's okay. But your goal is to get there eventually and release all of them. Because then students will see the, what's in it, right? So your supports, uh, I have a third party platform that I also have students go through, like Connect. Anybody use Connect or McGraw-Hills Connect? Yeah, okay. So, um, and I don't, so I limit the places that students can get lost. So deep integration, they don't have to go to McGraw-Hill and sign it. This is just click away, use with the, you know, with the, um, the rep to integrate it. That way students, I'm like, I don't know. And what that happens here with deep integration is that when they, when they launch through McGraw-Hill or whatever third party, and they do their activities there, the grades go through the tunnel, go straight to my grade book. It's awesome. Saves me hours, hours. Who doesn't want to save time? Resources, like tech support, all of the other things that are you know, specific to class, are right there in the second module, right? Or excuse me, on that resource module. Module one, onboarding. This is probably where I need to go and just show you what it looks like because I see that that's just not going to work there. Never. Modules. Come on. Yeah. No, that's not going to work, is it? All right. All right, so here's module one. Can you see that? A little better, hopefully. Date. All right, start here, complete this module, read this overview first, get started. Step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And some of those are with points. And the goal is just to take out all of those disabling conditions in week one that we can. So students are ready to dive in content. Let me show you what read this overview looks like. This week's purpose, the outcomes for week one, the modules checklist, but with the time. So it follows the same format. This is why CAS, you know, we, we, we templatize things. You do it for one class, you can do it again in another class. You just change content. It's a beautiful thing. You save yourself so much time. So much time. Okay? Right? Let me show you a different... Um, oh, excuse me. I should have hit modules. Oops. I'm going to start speeding up here a little bit because I see the time. So here's another. And then we put things like, oh, last day to withdraw. So that shows the transcript. Because some students don't know they have that right. We've had students who come up and said, I didn't know we could do that, and now I have a W in my first generation college student. Let's just be very, very transparent about that, okay? because it really hits their grade, right? So um, here's a read this first overview for week two, which is really the first content. So you could see that the outcomes, you know, this class has like six or seven outcomes, module checklist, and so on, like what happens, right? And then a routinize things, which I'm going to go back here so you can see that. Because I think the point will be seen. Mastery through practice. So this is in the syllabus. It's also in a video, and it's also on the website. So we say, here's how we're going to learn the Bloom Taxonomy. On Sunday, we're going to focus on text. We use adaptive learning. Oops, sorry. Adaptive, adaptive learning technology for that and some videos, okay? And then on Monday, Tuesday, we focus on Canvas discussion so that we can apply, we can comprehend and apply. And then on Wednesday, we do peer reviews, which we spend a lot of time really thinking about and analyzing what it is we discussed. On Thursday, we have another interactive, multiple attempts, because uh, we really look for mastery 
right? I'm not, I just want them to make sure they, they, they develop their skill set. On Friday, we have the quiz, and if there's a project or a wrap-up, it's on Saturday. Very explicit. This is how the brain works, and this is why we spend time this way, and that's why we repeat this activity week after week. There's Sunday. There's, where's my discussion? Right there, discussion, sorry. Right, interactive quiz. Week three, you can see it repeats. But there are still areas where, you know, the skeletal, the skeletal framework is the same and you can embed things to customize it for the week that's appropriate for your content and for your outcome. Week four, same thing. By week three and four, students are on board. They, they will resist it at first because it looks like, my God, this is so much. I'm going to jump because of the time to show you. Uh, so there's, you know, the purpose in the class, okay, initial post. Very transparent, lots of guidelines about how to do something. Lots of instructions, but they get trained. It's not like, you know, by week four, they're still having to figure out what the instructions were, but this is, this, is, this is how I'd like to see your post to look. This is the post, you know, the discussion post and so on. Comments and replies um, and so on. Rubric that's aligned with the outcomes. Everything's aligned, right? And again, that purpose, the instructions, the grading for the assignment, tips for success, the rubric, okay? And for the technologists, you could actually assign on the back end ways to capture the outcomes so you can record it through grading learning mastery for Canvas, I think it's called. How many, how many of you use Canvas? Yes, yeah, so do you know what I'm talking about, the learning mastery, right? You can connect the outcome to the back end so you can report out which outcomes are met and you just press a little button that says report. 77% of your students met outcome or 56 did. And that's the kind of data set you want, right? All right. And this is actually a checklist which you can't see, but you will have the document so you can look at it more closely. What I want to show you though, by the way, is this. Applying all of those stuff, that all of the things that you, I'm sorry, some of it you didn't see, because it's now, almost, I have two minutes to show you, right? Is that um, in 2017, before these were applied, the pass rate was 81% at 1.0, the 92, the 93 now, this is current, at the end size, that's a pretty good end size. But I'm excited about 2.0, because it takes 2.0 to actually pass the class. So in 2017, it was 66%, 82, and now we have about nine out of 10 students passing this class. And the grade is higher, and the mean is higher and the standard deviation is narrower. More students are performing at higher levels. That's what we wanna see in each and every single class and replicating that at the program level. And it requires scalability. So it's not just one instructor at a time, although as in each instructor, you teach three or four classes, right? Or at, you know, a quarter and maybe nine or more a year, that's a lot of students being impacted. A lot of students. And so what I would suggest to you is you focus on certain processes to build your capacity first. Deep learn all those evidence-based practices because it is not the template. You can have pretty little headers, but if the meat is not right, you don't cook it up right, you, you won't eat right either. Partner with your instructional designer so you save yourself some time to develop templates that work. I would prioritize gateway courses for the most bang for your buck. Those are courses that students take a lot of and they need in order to pass. Put your energy